وأنبت الأزهار تزخرف الجبال من أنزل الأمطار فجر الأنهار وأنبت الأزهار تزخرف الجبال ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله والحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا ما يحده الله فلا مدل له وما يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin, we begin by praising Allah and we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is Abdullah, he is the worshipper of Allah, the servant of Allah, the slave of Allah, and he is a Rasulullah, he is the Messenger of Allah. After that, the best speech is the Book of Allah, and the best way is the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion. And every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is a bid'ah, an innovation. And all of the innovations are misguidance, all misguidance is going astray, and all going astray is in the fire. Brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. Today, we want to talk about an important question. A question that is on the tongues and in the minds of many people. It is a claim that is made against our religion, the religion of Islam. An accusation in fact, a slander against our religion. That our religion oppresses women. And I intend here today, I hope to demonstrate, not only that this is a lie and a slander, but actually we will see who are the people, and which is the nation, and which is the ideology that is in fact really responsible for oppressing women. And sometimes when you get into a discussion with people, it's very important to define your terms. Define your terms. Try and understand what is it exactly you are talking about. When you say Islam oppresses women, we want to understand what these terms mean. Now hopefully, most of us understand what the term women means. We hope, anyway. Okay? But the term we want to talk about today is the term oppression. What does oppression mean? And I'm going to spend a little bit of time defining and looking into the concept of oppression. What does it mean? What is its 
reality. And this is very important. So let's define this term oppression. First of all, there's no doubt that oppression is something that everybody hates and despises. Nobody likes oppression. The use of the word oppression is a type of an offensive derogatory term. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said that zulm, the oppression, will stand as darkness on the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran that He does not love the zalimun, the oppressors. And so it is very clear that Islam itself and the Quran itself condemns oppression. And in fact, our noble religion orders us, and it is one of our duties and obligations, to fight against oppression. And that is one of the very reasons why we are called to jihad, to relieve people from tyranny and from oppression. So oppression is not something that Islam tolerates. Oppression is something that this noble religion condemns. It is something, of course, that all human beings hate. So let us therefore define actually what we mean by oppression. Implicit in the meaning of the word oppression is the concept of denying something its rights. Now we're very used to hearing a lot about rights, especially so-called human rights. We hear often about people's human rights being violated. We also have animal rights. And different sections of society have different rights. So, we, in order to understand what oppression is, we have to make a further understanding. What is rights? What is the right of something? What does that mean when we talk about human rights or this is the right of something? Okay. The right of something means it implies that it is something that is natural to it. So the right of something implies, and that is understood in its meaning, that it is something that is part of its nature. It is natural to it. Let's give an example. Now, has anyone seen the, f the film Free Willy? Okay, did it make you cry? Didn't it make you cry, that film? Made me cry. Okay, so if you haven't seen it, Free Willy is about this great big killer whale. And this great big beautiful killer whale is locked up in a small little compound for people's entertainment. Now of course, I don't know if any of you went and have ever been to see one of these killer whales or some of these dolphins put on display in these small little pens where they jump and they go through hoops and so on and so forth. And of course as little children we go and we watch it and it's all very amusing. Isn't that fantastic? But a lot of people must go away thinking about how an animal, such a beautiful animal, could be confined to such a narrow space. An animal that was created, whose natural environment is to swim in thousands of miles of ocean. And so without doubt, most people would recognize that this is a type of oppression. That this animal is oppressed. Because why? It has been taken away from its natural environment. It's taken away from what is naturally due to it. To be free. So, this is oppression. Another example of oppression that is, I'm sure, very easy for all of us to understand. It is the right of a worker. If you work for somebody and you are employed by somebody, implicit in the nature of being a worker is that you get paid for your work. If someone does not pay you for your work, then without doubt we would all agree that this is oppression. That we have been deprived of our rights. I worked, my right is to be paid. If someone deprives me, I have been oppressed. Okay, so I hope therefore that we have understood
oppression. Oppression means to deprive something of its rights. Which means to deprive something of what its, what its nature requires of it. So therefore, let's go back to our discussion. The point at hand. Does Islam oppress women? Does Islam oppress women? Therefore, we ask the question again, with our definitions, does Islam deny women their rights? Does Islam deprive women of what is natural to them? Does it take them away from their nature? And does it deprive them of what naturally they should have? This is the question. And of course, to answer that question, we also have to answer before that another question. What is the nature of women? What is their nature? We can only really talk about whether something or someone oppresses women or not when we understand what is the nature of women. Does Islam deprive women of their nature? Does Islam take away from them rights that are naturally due to them? Due to their nature? This is the question. And then we will see, certainly, without a doubt, that there is no way that Islam oppresses women. Because Islam is the religion that recognizes, in fact, the true nature of women. Because it is from the one who created women. It is from the one who created the universe. Islam is from Allah. It is from God. It is from the Creator. And He knows us better than we know ourselves. He is closer to us in His knowledge than our jugular vein. He is intimate in His knowledge with every single detail of our existence. Allah, He is Al-Latif. He is the one who is aware of every single subtlety. And Islam has been revealed by Allah. And Allah is the one who is most acquainted with the nature of the woman and the nature of the man. And so what we find in the religion of Islam is that Islam has set a paradigm, Islam has set an example, Islam has given us and defined for us the roles of men and the roles of women according to our natures, not according to some ideology. Not according to some hopeful or wishful thinking. That wouldn't it be nice if this, and wouldn't it be nice with that. But this is not actually connected in any way with the reality of how people are. And what we're going to find, indeed, is that the Western world has been experimenting with human beings on a massive scale for the past 60 years. Humanity has been going through a massive experiment. And I'm sure we are all familiar with the ideology prevalent in the West. The ideology that tells us not that men and women are different, but that men and women are the same. There is no difference between the man and the woman. And as they claim, our differences are a product of conditioning. Our differences are a product of conditioning. This is the old debate between nature and nurture. Nature and nurture. What is your nature and what have you been nurtured? What have you been grown up with? How much of our mentality, how much of our behavior is a product of our nature and how much is a product of our environment and our upbringing? And of course, as you know, 